Welcome back everybody to another video. Today we'll be reviewing the GTX 760, a card that's very much in the same spot as the last Kepler GPU we checked out. It released back in 2013 under the 28 nanometer Kepler architecture, with the last game ready driver being back in 2021. Meaning it's gonna have to use some pure brute force to play any kind of modern day games. Which, as we'll see, can be done, but may not be the best bang for your buck in today's secondhand market. First off, let's take a look at the specs, shall we? We've got our GPU running at 993 MHz at base, which will boost up to a much more solid 1059. Our 2GB of GDDR5 memory is also running at a very nice 1502 MHz at base, all running on a nice 256-bit memory bus. Powering this PCIe 3.0 card will require two 6-pin connectors, as it does pull 170 watts under full load. Looking at the specs, you would think that this card is very much like a souped-up GTX 670, and in many ways it is. But it's a little more complicated than that, as parts of it were very much cut down. Its shading units went down about 15%, as well as a drop in its TMUs and one less SMX count which makes its theoretical performance a little bit worse than the 670, about 7% in tech power-ups case, although for the price of 250 compared to 400 at MSRP, that trade-off would have definitely been worth it for that frugal shopper just looking for an upgrade. But how does this all equal out in the gaming performance? That is something we're going to have to check out in the benchmarks. With our standard Ryzen 5 3600 test bench, let's see how it performs, shall we? With 3D Mark showing us the relative performance of the 760, it's overall actually pretty decent, scoring a solid 6120 for Fire Strike, but only 1556 for our Time Spy score. While overall a good bit lower than the 670 we reviewed before, that was an EVGA variant, which means that thing was kind of on crack, and it had 2GB of more VRAM. Overall not too bad, but it's clear that once again we're sticking around with 1080p here, and 1440p should only be reserved for those indie titles or games that don't require the fastest of frame rates. Starting off with a game from within a year of the card's launch, Alan Wake was able to run pretty damn well, but still managed to catch our card lacking when heavy special effects were in use. Running at a max to 1080p high resolution, we averaged around 65 FPS for our game, with dips down to 47 and 39. As stated, the game dropped frames with special effects or heavy lighting, but it never hindered the overall playing experience in a major way. Either way, we still got a ton of graphical options to tighten up those frame times if needed. For those kinds of early 2010 titles, I'm sure this card was more than enough for the average gamer, even one on a budget. Modern-ish indie titles like Slime Rancher do have good showings on a card like this one. Running at 1080p default settings, we've got a great 114 FPS average, with solid lows of 81 and 57. While there may potentially be more frame dips and heavier, more crowded scenes, this game overall doesn't care much about frame rate as it is. You could quite easily crank the settings, slap an FPS cap on if you wanted, and have a good time. For those looking for a card to play some simple indie titles, this could very well be the card for you. Getting our multiplayer game in with BattleBit Remastered, the Chunky 760 does have a pretty solid showing overall. In a chaotic 127 vs 127 match, we're averaging a 101 FPS average here, running at a 1080p high preset. Our frame times can fluctuate pretty wildly here, anywhere from the 70s to 120s, which can be less than ideal in a course quarters gunfight, but overall this game is running pretty well. Not to mention you still got several options should you want a higher frame rate or more stable frame times. While Counter-Strike threw up a driver warning, much like in our 670 video, the game ran perfectly fine on this card, albeit with a little bit of jagged edges. Running at 1080p medium, which auto-enables FSR quality mode, we got a solid 111 for our average, with lows of 66 and 53. 
playing this bot match showed our FPS fluctuating pretty wildly here from the 90s to 120s, which could definitely trip someone up. But nothing was that bad besides trying to use incendiaries or smoke grenades, which dropped our frames even lower. Although we never truly dipped down below 60 FPS, so overall it was still decently smooth throughout. While it is very playable, maybe tweaking some of those settings to tighten up frame times would work a bit better if you wanted a competitive FPS experience. Fortnite was working surprisingly better than I thought with how limited the card was in terms of VRAM. With the game set to 1080p performance mode with high settings, we averaged a pretty good 144 FPS average, with lows of 50 and 26. The lows were mostly when loading into the map and jumping from the battle bus, but when actually playing it was overall decently stable. Although it could fluctuate pretty wildly, ranging anywhere from 100 to 170, depending on the scene. You can still get some good games in, but don't be surprised if a massive frame drop every now and then catches you off guard. While Halo Infinite refuses to run on any card below 4GB of VRAM, the Master Chief Collection is available in its stead and is running pretty fluidly, even with higher settings. Playing on 1080p high and going through the Reach campaign, we stood at a solid 113 FPS average with lows of 70 and 59. While the frame times could bounce around depending on the scene a little, it didn't hamper the gameplay experience any, and we easily dispatched various grunts, jackals, and elites while playing through Oni's sword base. Deep Rock Galactic, despite not normally being graphically intensive, does push our card pretty hard here, especially with only 2GB of VRAM. Running at 1080p medium, we got 110 FPS average, with okay lows of 50 and 21. While the averages were alright, our frame times overall could be pretty erratic as shown by the spikes in our graph. While it is overall very playable, if one is looking for a more stable experience, dropping down to low should be more than enough. AMD's FSR is also an option, only if you can handle a decent bit of blurriness, however. While Prey may only be a couple of years into the card's lifespan, it definitely puts this card through its paces, but still manages to be just playable. Running at 1080p low, we've got a pretty good 88 FPS average with 55 for our 1%. Our point low got obliterated from the game freezing up at one point, but otherwise I'm sure it would have been alright. Running around the Talos lobby area and killing some enemies, the frame times felt alright, showing that the game was still capable of doing at least 1080p 60, even if we had to take a bit of a hit to the visuals. Overall, it's playable, but you may have to look out for that rogue stutterer too. No Man's Sky shows us the real folly of approaching a modern day title with a mere 2 gigabytes of VRAM, as even with major visual sacrifices, we still haven't reached close to a 60 FPS average. 1080p standard with performance FSR enabled, we've only got 42 for our averages with 33 and 5 for the lows. Trying to load into our save and, on occasion when loading in new assets, the game could absolutely chug as it offsets some of that VRAM load into our system memory. Once things settle down, our frame times are surprisingly pretty stable for the most part showing that this card is perfectly running the game at 1080p 30 frames, but anything in the ballpark of 60 will require a resolution drop. Overall, it is okay, but one should very much temper their expectations going in. In conclusion, the 760 performed rather admirably for a card of such limited VRAM and some cutdown shader units. Some games needed some major sacrifices in the visuals department, some refused to run at all like SCP-5K and Halo Infinite, and overall it's definitely showing its age. While I could recommend it for those older games and simpler indie titles, its price on the secondhand market places it in similar price brackets to other and more appealing cards, especially for gigabyte VRAM variants, which is really the minimum you should try and shoot for if you wanted to do some decent gaming on these cards. Those percentile lows will absolutely thank you for it. 
Also, the lack of any driver support for the future is also something to keep in mind. I would like to thank you all for watching this first video of the new year. If you like what you saw, feel free to check out the several other GP reviews I've done on my channel. Have a good day, and I will be sure to see you all later.